Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Heithouse. We're about to study ecosystems from the bottom to the top, and we need your help. My investigation takes me to the southern tip of Florida, to the large body of water called Florida Bay. It's home to one of the largest and richest seagrass beds on the planet. These prairies of the ocean host a variety of awesome wildlife, including manatees, sea turtles, and fish. But with all the animals here, it's strange we don't see more top predators. To figure out why, I need to explore the entire ecosystem by starting at the bottom of the food chain. It doesn't matter if you're a lion or a shark. The energy supporting your ecosystem starts with the sun and gets harnessed by producers like plants and algae. Plants, like seagrasses, capture the sun's energy through a process called photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, plants take carbon dioxide and water, then use the energy from the sun to transform them into sugars and oxygen. They also need nutrients to grow. I study sharks. Okay, go ahead, Mike. 267! But to know about these top predators, we need to find out what influences the amount of food at the base of the ecosystem. And Florida Bay is the perfect spot to start our investigation. Before we head out on the water to study this ecosystem, I need you to develop some hypotheses about what conditions should help seagrasses grow. Great job! The amount of light, carbon dioxide, and nutrients might affect how much plants grow on land and in the water. Let's test your ideas. How's it going, Jim? Good, Mike. How are you? This is Jim Forkren. He's a world's expert on seagrasses. We're going to join his team to test your hypotheses. So how are we going to find out if light influences how much seagrass grows? So that's a really good hypothesis because we know that light drives photosynthesis and that's the process that plants use to make their food. So we can go out in the environment, we can measure the amount of plants in an environment, and we can also measure the amount of light that's there, and we can see what kind of relationships we find. Does that mean we get to go scuba diving? We get to go diving. You're going to be wet. Let's go. Jim's study site is 20 miles away, so we need to get moving. Okay guys, hold on. Okay. The seafloor of Florida Bay is almost entirely carpeted with seagrasses, and average is only about three feet deep. Seagrasses are flowering plants, like the grasses that grow on your front lawn. They've been around since the time of the dinosaurs, and they're only found in salt water. Before we dive in, we need to measure the amount of sunlight. We use a light meter that tells us the amount of ambient light at each depth. Okay, 1.3. It's pretty simple. The deeper you go, the less light. But to do science, we need accurate numbers. So we use a digital light meter. 1.5 meters. 0 0.83. Now that we've got the numbers, it's time to get wet. Jim takes me to a shallow water location first. We place a quadrat on the seafloor and begin to measure the density of growth. To do this, we measure the heights and make notes of the abundance and different species found within the quadrat. Next, we head to deep water, where there's less light. Same procedure here. That was a great dive. You use the data I'm sending to figure out if light affects the growth of seagrasses. Nice job! Now we know that light levels can affect plant growth. But what about nutrients? 
This is Justin Campbell and he studies seagrasses. We're gonna work with him to figure out how nutrients can affect seagrass growth. So how are we gonna do that? We're gonna add nutrients to the seagrass bed and study over time how the seagrasses change in terms of growth and community structure. And we're gonna compare that to another location where we haven't added nutrients. Well, that sounds pretty cool. Let's dive in and do it. First, Justin shows me how they add nutrients to a system. Today, this seagrass patch gets a sprinkling of nitrogen. Next, we head to a control area where no nutrients have been added. We take several measurements and record the data. Then, we investigate a seagrass area where nutrients were added several months ago. Notice any differences? Again, we collect the data. Okay, your turn to make some graphs and figure out if nutrients affect seagrass growth. Nice job! Now we know how the amount of light and nutrients affect the growth of seagrass. But to figure out how many animals are out there, Virginia and I are going to have to go on a dive. Ready? Yep. Let's go. Okay. To count the animals, we need to do a transect. Basically, we follow a straight line and record all the animals we see. Virginia Forkren, Jim's daughter, is going to give me a hand. Here are some herbivores. They eat the seagrasses. Oh, there's a fish. That's a sheep's head. Finally. There's a top predator. It's taken a while, but we finally found a shark. Okay, the data are on the way. It's up to you to figure out how this ecosystem is structured and why predators are so rare. Great job today! We really learned a lot about how energy flows through ecosystems and you figured out why predators aren't so common. Remember, there's lots more cool stuff out there, so until next time, keep on exploring! <laughs>